Hi, everybody, and welcome to lesson one of the Kabbalah of numerology. I called this lesson numerology mechanics. Now, the topic is quite mysterious for many people. Numerology is a very mysterious topic in general, and Hebrew numerology, the most ancient form of numerology, is really mysterious. What's amazing about it, at least I think this, is that despite how mysterious it is, it's absolutely a mainstream part of Jewish thought, and it's specifically a mainstream part of Torah study. Now, if you really want to know, if you really want to understand the Torah, you have to know gematria. You have to know numerology, because otherwise you're missing an entire layer of Torah interpretation. So let's begin with kind of giving you the, the mechanics, the background behind Kabbalah numerology. And most importantly, if I want you to remember that you're really learning to a certain extent, a new language. Now in Judaism, we call Kabbalah numerology, gematria, gematria. What I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up my handy PowerPoint here. Uh, and I hope that this is going to help you. It'll give you not only having it in front of you, having your handout in front of you, which I encourage you to print out and to write notes, but also having this little PowerPoint here. So numerology mechanics, gematria. What is gematria? Gematria is numerology, but it's also the secret code of creation. The reason behind this is because the world was created according to the Kabbalists with Hebrew letters, with language. And we're gonna talk about this a little later. Understanding gematria, the code of the letters is really understanding the code of creation. And so that's why I think it's so important that we explore this because if you understand the mechanics of how gematria works, well, it's our little way, our little inkling into trying to figure out a bit on how God created the world. We're also exploring the code of the Torah, the code of biblical analysis. It's really hard to have an accurate grasp of the Torah, of Judaism, without understanding the concept and the mechanics of gematria. Gematria, the Hebrew word for numerology, once again, um, there are different ways to read the Hebrew letters. And when you encounter Hebrew letters, you can analyze the letters in different dimensions. You can look at the language. You can look at the art. You can look at the music. And you can look at the mathematics. So the language. Let's take a look at that. When you look at language, let's say you open up a book in English or in Hebrew. If you open up a Torah or a Bible, you would assume that the way you understand the text is through language, through the meaning of the words, through the letters and the words, through like anything else that you would understand, through comprehending the elements of language. So if you open up a book in a written form, we typically focus on the language and the meaning of the letters and the words. We read the narrative. And it makes sense and we understand it and it's wonderful. But what's interesting is that when it comes to Hebrew, Hebrew has another layer. Not only do the words mean something, but the shape of the letters mean something. You can analyze the shape of the Hebrew letters, the shape of the Aleph, the shape of the Bet, the shape of the Gimel, the shape of the Dalit, and each 
shape carries meaning and it carries layers of meanings. I'll just give you one little example. Take a look at the Aleph, right? And I'm, you can picture an Aleph in your mind. You know, it has that line and it has the element over there and then the element in the bottom. So just one interpretation of the, the formation of the Aleph is you have a Yud above, a dot above, a dot below, and a line in the middle. There's a God above, there's the human below, and there's the soul that connects us. So the, the God above, the person below, and then you have the soul that connects, the line, the Kav, we call it, that connects the two. That's just looking at the Aleph, and there's just one layer of looking at the Aleph. I'm just kind of just wetting your palate a little bit. Now, the energy that is captured in the shape of the letter is so powerful. And each letter is so powerful, which means that Hebrew letters don't just mean something when you put them in a word, but they actually mean something independently on their own. The shape, the design, the art, every letter has the art has a meaning, irrespective of how it's combined with the other letters. That individual letter has a message and a meaning in its shape. And you should also know that when it comes to Jewish law, writing a Torah scroll, writing a tefillin, writing a mezuzah is very precise. It has to be written in a very precise faction, fashion. In fact, in Jewish law, think about this for a moment. If you're reading a Torah, and you notice two letters are touching, which means the black ink is connected between two letters. The entire Torah scroll is not kosher. There are 304,806 letters in a Torah scroll. But if two letters are touching, the entire scroll is invalid. It's pasul. And you have to take it to a scribe who fixes and makes each letter independent. Now, you're going to say to yourself, come on. I mean, really, what is the big deal? It's just two letters. There's 304,804 other letters. But the law of writing the Hebrew letters is that it's so precise and it's so important that every single letter is so important. I mean, we'll go a step further that every letter represents a soul and that we actually have a mitzvah, the 613th mitzvah in the Torah is to write your own Torah scroll. And we're able to fulfill that mitzvah by writing a letter in the Torah. Why? Because every letter is important. Without that letter, the Torah is invalid. So therefore, by owning that letter, by writing that letter in the scroll, you actually fulfill, you actually place your soul into that entire Torah, and you connect it with the 304,805 other letters, and therefore the Torah becomes complete. So we each have a piece of the Torah within us. The third level is the music. When you read the Torah in the synagogue, there's a way, there's a cantillation, there's a way that the Torah is chanted. And actually, if you have a chumash, if you have a Torah book, you'll find that there's actually musical notes there. In the Torah itself, there's no vowels and there's no uh, musical notes. But if you have a chumash, you'll see that it actually has musical notes there. And the fourth is what we're really we're going to focus on in this course. And that is the mathematics, the numerology. The letters contain a mathematical formula. The words in Hebrew can be understood on multiple levels. You can understand the language, the meaning. You can look at the design. You can look at the musical meaning. And you can also look at the mathematical meaning of it. The Torah can be interpreted on multiple levels. And what's amazing is they all work together and they are so powerful together. They give us this powerful, this deep, this broad mosaic of meaning on the verses of the Torah. The Torah is not one dimensional. It's not even two dimensional. It is multiple dimensional. And they're all working simultaneously. 
I mean, that is why it really is the code of creation. It's kind of like, if you remember back in the day, for those of us who are ancient, there was an overhead projector. Remember the overhead projectors? And on the projectors, what did you have that they were called um, transparencies? So you had these transparency sheets. And if you knew how to, how to you know, the, the overhead projector would have the, the, the light and the, the kind of the arm that came up. And if you were able, you could actually layer the different transparencies and you can put one layer and one image, one maybe one had color, one didn't, and you could put them on top of the other and through those transparencies, you could get the full picture. Well, the same thing with the Torah. When it comes to the Hebrew language, especially the Hebrew language as encoded in Torah, you have Torah interpretation on multiple layers. You can understand the language, the, the meaning of the word, the artistic meaning, the musical meaning, and you can understand the, numero the numerological meaning of those words of the verse. Of course, this course and what we're gonna study fo focuses on the numbers. This is the matrix, the code of the Torah and the code of creation. These are the secrets that pretty much from centuries only the Kabbalists would dabble in because it's so deep, it's kind of amazing. So before we, we jump in and, and, and get our feet wet, I wanna outline what we're gonna do. We are going to explore the basics of gematria, the basics of, of Hebrew numerology. I'm gonna explain the meaning of gematria. What does the word mean? We're gonna describe the process by which numbers are associated with letters. And then we're gonna look at a number of case studies of gematriot of actual gematrias and the number of numerological formulas that you and I can work and apply to make sense of texts and Jewish ideas. So what does gematria mean? What does the word gematria mean? What is it? So spoiler alert, it means numerology. That's the word for numerology. But the question is, why does it mean that? Where does it come from? Some people say that the word gematria actually comes from the Greek word for geometry. If you see here, I kind of wrote, the, I went and found the original Greek for geometry. But the funny thing is that why would it be go, geometry be the word that is used? Geometry, what is that? It's mathematics and relativity. Geometry is mathematics and relativity in space. And if you think about it, it's very similar to gematria because gematria is also about mathematics and connections and relativity. So it's about how things are relative to one another based on their mathematical formulas. So I think that geometry and gematria do have a very strong similarity. So it kind of does make sense for gematria to be um, called based on the Hebrew, the Greek word geometry. So according to others, the word gematria actually comes from the Aramaic, where I wrote here, gay mitura, which means a wide valley that emerges from the bottom of a mountain. So in a similar way, gematria indicates that a valley of wisdom that emerges from the mountain of the Torah. If the Torah is the mountain of wisdom, so much wisdom, but so high and, and, and lofty, Gematria is the path. It's that valley that emerges from that, that stream, from that mountain and shares the wisdom in a way that's magical. So that's the Aramaic, Gi Metura. Gematria is usually applied to Hebrew words and biblical Hebrew words, actually. Although sometimes we find gematria in other languages. Uh, there is gematria in, in Aramaic. There's also gematria in Yiddish and in English. But typically, gematria is Hebrew numerology. And we're going to use the Hebrew language. And just for you, having a very basic recognition of the Hebrew letters uh, is enough for you to be able to follow this 
even if you don't, I'm going to try to um, balance uh, balance it, but just having a recognition of the looks of the Hebrew letters is going to really enhance your experience through this course. Now, there are four levels of biblical interpretation. They are known by the mnemonic pardes, P-R-D-S, or pei, reish, dalid, uh, saf, or samach, sorry. Pardes means the orchard. And it's an acronym for the four levels of studying Torah. Pshat, the straightforward explanation. Remez, the allegorical. Drush, which is the homiletical, the stories, the midrash. And Sod, the mystical. Where do you think Gematria falls under? Think about it a second. I know you're probably thinking sod. Your, your first thing is mystical. Of course, mystical. Actually, most opinions uh, say that it, gematria is under remez, under allegorical. And that's what's fascinating about it. It's so mystical. Yes, it is. But really, it's allegorical. So though some do say that it's, it's more mystical than allegorical, I, I would say they fall under both of the categories. But most opinions are that it falls more under the remez category more under the allegorical category. Now, people wonder when it comes to gematria, you can just take numbers and you can take letters and you can start coming up with explanations. Not really. According to the classic way of understanding gematria, you need it based, you have to base it on an existing connection on an existing concept, something that you already know, that you're just trying to find a reason to support it. So the, the gematria, what it does is it's not on its own. It's just there to support the text itself. In other words, you know that this verse or this concept has multiple layers of meaning, including whatever this one is or whatever subjects we're talking about. So you know that it has a certain given meaning and what gematria is going to do, it's going to enhance that. It's going to expose that. It's going to expose the matrix. It exposes the numbers behind it, and it shows it how this verse, meaning that thing, is not the same random connection, but actually numerologically sound. The numbers line up, and they're a perfect match. That's the point of gematria. That's the point of Hebrew numerology. So you don't just start throwing stuff against the wall and see what sticks. Oh, look at that, that's interesting, or, or that's interesting. When you know there's an association already, you look at that association, you look at the numbers, and you confirm that those numbers match. And, and this comes uh, from, if you look at your, your handout, you'll see in Ethics of Our Fathers, uh, 318, Gematriot are condiments to wisdom. They're part and parcel of, Jew, of Judaism. And that's why they're so mainstream. So just like ketchup and mustard is an accessory to your sandwich, gematriot are an accessory to Torah knowledge. It means that after you have a certain base of knowledge, after you know something, the numerology is the icing on the cake. It makes that connection and exposes that connection that conceptualizes what is already there. And once you have something that you know, you can build on it and you can solidify it with the numerology, which means that numerology is used in cases where there is already a tradition for that general meaning. If we look at, let's say, um, Maimonides. If you look at Maimonides, Maimonides says that everything was given to Moses at Sinai. Everything, every study, not everything, but every study of Torah. In the gates of understanding, 
he says, all is written in the Torah and explicitly hinted through um, Gematria. Oh, actually, it's here on your, on your text. The Ramban, in his introduction to the Biblical Commentary, he says, everything handed to Moses in the gates of understanding, all is written in the Torah explicitly or hinted through in the words of Gematria through the forms of letters. So you see right here that Ramban, the commentary on the Torah, he gives a, a basic explanation. He says that a person should not think the calculation of letters that we call gematria is nonsense or random, since a person can take in and transform many verses to strange and evil ideas. What he's saying is don't take numerology and start coming up with your own things. He says the reason that a person should use gematria to reach conclusions that arose in their head. Rather, we have a Kabbalah. Kabbalah is tradition. I know we think of Kabbalah as the mystical, but also literally Kabbalah means tradition. We have a tradition that Moses was given certain gematriot, certain numerologies to be a reminder, like a mnemonic of what was said orally. And so the calculation of gematria is the upkeep what was given so that it doesn't get destroyed because most of what was given to Moses at Sinai was not written down until much later. So in order to remember all of what God gave him, there were these mnemonics, there was the numerology. So gematria, as Nachmanides puts it, is meant to support the essence of what we know and to add on and make it richer and to show the code behind it but not just to make stuff up. Let's just take a, a moment and talk about how numerology or biblical numerology or Bible codes became popular. So obviously there was that very famous book by that New York Times journalist, Michael Drosnan in, in the nineties called the Bible codes. And there he writes how uh, he sent Rabin uh, a letter that he was gonna be assassinated it's wonderful. And, and the truth is, look, there's 22 letters in the Hebrew language. There's 304,806 letters in the Torah. Do 304,806 to the, to the power of 22. I mean, there's infinite possibilities. Of course, you're going to find this thing and that thing. But we're not talking about making up and, and seeing if Kennedy was going to be assassinated or Rabin was going to be assassinated. We're talking about a system that reveals truths of Torah that are authentic and we know the concepts from other sources and it's supported by the numbers and you can see the code as it plays out and that's when it becomes amazing not when you start coming up with predictions or you try to figure out what the 649 uh, or the lottery numbers are that's not the point it's nice, it's wonderful, it's great for show. I know that we have this dramatic world and everything is about you know what can be shown on TV and, and, and what's gonna get our ratings. This is not what it's about. Gematria is to explore authentic Torah ideas. And it's not some kind of uh, modern uh, pop culture matchup like uh, some people try to make it. Gematria is not about picking a winner in the Kentucky Derby. It's about authentic Torah study and the analysis using the letters and the numbers of the Torah in real tradition. It's actually one of the reasons why I've waited so long to really uh, give this class and talk about it because uh, I know that a lot of people can very easily uh, misconstrue it, which is why I'm talking about it. All of the great commentaries cautioned that once you know the methodology and you know the number system of gematria it's now open and you can apply it as wide as you wish and you can actually run it through a computer you can you can go to a gematrilator <laughs> there is it really exists i remember the first gematrilator we used to play with um it was a, you know one of those three and a half inch floppies and you can come up with all sorts of combinations, but that doesn't make it authentic. It could be that it's interesting. 
It could be coincidence, but that doesn't make it necessarily authentic. There's a difference between real authentic gematria and non-authentic gematria. And that's basically my introduction. That's maybe some more of my disclaimer. And we're going to explore authentic gematria tonight and over the next four weeks that are taught by classic and well-accepted sources. So now let's move on and talk about the Kabbalah of Gematria and understand where this is coming from, where the numerology comes from on a mystical level. So the Torah tells us that God created the world. In the book of Genesis, it starts off that God created the world through language. That God said, let there be light and there was light. So God said, it says, God said, let there be light and there was light. God said, let there be this and there was this. And God said, let there be that and there was that. God used, again, it's anthropomorphic. Did God actually use speech? But as we know speech, God uses speech. So creation happens through a process of conversation, through a process of communication, through speech, through language. It says in the chapter five, uh, number one of Pirkei Avot, it says that um, the world was created with 10 divine utterances, literally 10 divine utterances with words. In the prayers, every single morning, we have a prayer called the Baruch Sha'amar, one of the, the opening of the Pesuke de Zimra, of the verses of praise. And in that prayer, it says, blessed is he who spoke and the world came into being. The world comes into being through God's speech. If God wanted to destroy the world today, God would just stop speaking because every single moment through God's speech is the world being created anew through our, their articulation of language. That is the language of the Torah. Using language as a methodology as a modality of creation itself. So if we analyze the opening verse of the Torah, the opening verse, Jim, I'm just gonna, just gonna show you this in the opening verse. It says, Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim et ha'aretz. You have it here on your screen and you have it in your book. Um, uh, it's the translation, which is Bereshit in the beginning, bara created. Elohim is one of the names of God. Et Hashamayim, et heavens, the et haaretz and et earth. I separated et because I want to show you this. So it's kind of a strange um, terminology that God created the heavens and the earth. That would be proper terminology, but it doesn't just say the heavens and the earth. It says et. It's like an added word. What is the et? What is the extra word et? Well, et has two letters. What do you see there in the et? The aleph and the tav. The aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew language and the tav is the last letter. So what is really God saying? Bereshit, in the beginning, the Torah says, bara Elohim, God created et, aleph to tav, the beginning to the end of the heavens, of the Hebrew language, of the code of creation, the et, and the beginning to the end, the aleph titaf of Haaretz of the earth. Look at that, just right in there in the first verse. So the way that Kabbalah explains this is the opening verse is telling us that God created the heavens and the earth with et, with language, with the aleph titaf, with the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, with the language of creation, with the aleph titaf, which means Hebrew, and the biblical language is actually the code of creation. You can see it right here in the first verse of the Torah. Think of computer code. Think of computer code. Think of the significance of computer code. Like right now, I don't know what this is, a header, dot display, mobile, a header. I actually just took this in the code of the Chabad and Niji website. And, but what I do know about this code is, I don't like that little swiggly thing there. I'm gonna take it out. Well, if I take it out, guess what? The code is not there anymore. And what I see on my screen is not going to come up the same way. There's a code to creation. Does it make sense? Uh, margin left, uh, colon, 20%, but it's a code. Just like computer code, the world has a code. 
and, and think of the significance that computer code does to create the image that you see on your screen. It's not just a random collection of letters, but it actually creates and makes something happen. So does the language of God found in the book of Genesis. The language itself does it, supports, and creates creation. So, so many things that we look at through a screen, it's almost all driven by code, driven by letters. And if you make an adjustment to that letter, you can change the reality that appears before you. If you have the wrong code, you can break it and the whole thing might be destroyed. The whole code might not work if one letter is incorrect. The Hebrew letters, Kabbalah says, are the very matrix of the universe. They comprise the code of existence. Everything is carefully coded and laid down in code. Picture it like this. Take the Hebrew letters of the Torah and lay them out in order, and that is your code of creation. That is your code of existence. And certainly the code of the opening chapter of Genesis, which talks about creation, that is the code of creation. Modify the letters and you are actually affecting creation itself. That is the extent of the powers of the Hebrew letters. And that's why it's so important that from the moment the Torah was written until now, we have not changed not one letter. Not only that, but we believe every single letter is perfect. There's not one letter out of place. Look there. We could have grammatically, if I was an editor, I would have edited out the et. But then you miss the whole power of the first verse of the Torah. And that's why there are certain Hebrew words that share the same letters. And when two words share the same letters, it's an indication that there's a highly, there's a high commonality between the two words. So let's take a word like the Kabbalists talk about stone. The word for stone is even, aleph, vet, nun. The code of stone is aleph, vet, nun. The substance, the matter that we call stone is coded by those three letters. That's what produces the stone. Similar to a, a chemical formula. Sodium chloride, right? These letters here are the code for sodium chloride. You know, hydrogen monoxide, two, the, the code for water, H2O. These codes, they're symbolic and they're significant. With the Hebrew, with the code of creation, you have two Hebrew words, and they may seem to mean two different things, but they're actually connected. And if they share the same letters, if they share the same code, there has to be connection. They have the same spiritual DNA. So let's take two words as an example. We're going to take emunah and omnot. Emunah means faith, and omnot means training, like you train an apprentice. Now you're going to say, my gosh, rabbi, I know rabbis are good at taking opposites and putting them together, but what does faith have to do with training? What is the connection between these two words? I mean, you don't even have to know the Hebrew language to see that they almost have the same letters, right? There's just uh, uh, two letters different right here. So the Kabbalists explain that they're connected because the core letters match. The Aleph, the Mem, and the Nun. And even if you don't have the same meaning, there's a spiritual connection between them because they share the Aleph, Mem, Nun, the same spiritual code, the same root. The root is the spiritual code. The connection is like this. How does one have Emunah? How does one have faith? True faith is when a person om not trains themselves in that way you have to do the work to train yourself to see God in everything around you. That's what builds faith. If we go through life and we're not paying attention, we're not looking to find the deeper story beneath the stories. It's going to be hard to have faith when we need it. You can't just decide to have faith when you need it. 
We have to train ourselves. Om not the training. We have to train ourselves to find something deeper in every situation. And that is what builds the muscle of faith. Faith is the product of work. And there are infinite combinations. And we're going to try to explore some of them. Again, I'm just wetting your palate here. I mean, we can go on and on. This class could be so, so, uh, so deep. I mean, we can go on and do the same exact thing, you know, over and over. So I think you're getting this idea that there are infinite combinations. There are infinite possibilities. I'm going to go through a couple of more. Let me give you one more. So you can see here, tet, va, uh, uh, vet, and ayin. I think that it's not complicated to see. That there's literally just one letter difference. They both have the same roots. So one is called teva, which means nature. And the second one is tuba'u, which means sunk. Once again, nature, sunk. So, so for example, this word, just to give you an idea, Teva in nature is obvious, but tuba'u is the word the, the Torah uses when it talks about the Egyptians that were chased out by the sea. Tuba'u, they sunk into the Sea of Reeds. Just to give you an idea what that word means, sunk. So nature and sunk. You can say they're completely different words, but if they share that same root, the tet, the vet, and the ayin, there must be a connection. I mean, nature is nature and sunk is at the bottom of the water. It's something completely different. Water, I guess, is part of nature, but it doesn't seem to have any conceptual connection. But remember how Hebrew letters are the code of creation and they're not random. They're very precise. So these two words share the same letters. There's a connection. What's the connection? What is nature? What is the very existence of nature? It is God hidden within this world. Because it's really God who makes the sun rise, not nature. It's really God who makes the wind blow, not nature. What is sunk? Sunk is, is, something, is when something sinks to the bottom and once again it's hidden. Nature is God hidden in this world. And sunk is when something is sunk into the bottom of the ocean it's hidden beneath the surface if you look at the surface you can't see that there's a ship underneath there and it's sunk down to the bottom so imagine if you take a treasure chest and you drop it in the ocean and it sinks to the bottom and you look at the ocean you don't see it but it's there it's sunk so when something sinks down it was apparent that you could see it before. And now it's sunk and you can no longer see it because it's under the water. I mean, obviously you can be a scuba diver and you can go find it, but that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is that it's no longer on the surface. It's hidden now. So what is nature again? It's the space which God dips under and you can no longer see God. A person can say the world Mother Nature, the sun, the wind, the ocean, the birds, the trees. I don't see any God. That's the point. God is sunk in nature. You see the connection? We don't see God on an apparent level. Another connection. We understand that the Hebrew letters are the code of creation. We've been saying this all evening. And therefore, two words share the same letters. It means that they are at least connected conceptually. And we understand that the code of creation, but what's the kicker? What happens when two words don't share the same Hebrew letters? But what if you count up the numerology associated with that word? If it matched the numbers associated with other words, that can also be an indication of the energy level connection. So again, if the letters match, it's connected. 
And if the numbers of the letters match, that could also be a connection. It's a bit of a, a looser connection. Obviously, if the letters are matching up, that's apparently above the surface. It seems like a stronger connection. But even, even if they don't, if the total numbers match up, that is indicative of a connection between these two words, between these two concepts. So I'm going to show you one. So remember that word that we used for God in the first verse of the Torah, Elohim? We pronounce differently, but we can't pronounce the name of God in vain. So I'm going to say Elohim and not the other one. And the other one is Hateva, which means the nature. So the first word Elohim, the name for God, and the second word Hateva, which means the nature. So we have God in and nature. So what's going on here? Again, the connection. Although they don't share the same letters, they do share the same gematria, our first gematria of this course. And what's the shared numerology? The number 86. I did the gematria. I'm going to show you how this works in a second, but I did the gematria for you here. They both have the same gematria of 86. Aleph, Lamed, Hey, Yud, Mem is the number 86, and Hateva, which is Hey, Tet, Vet, Ayin, also adds up to 86. So here we have another level of connection. The, the, the divine name, Elohim, signifies God within nature. When we say the word Elohim, Kabbalah talks about the fact that it's used for severity, in God's name of severity, and also on a numerological level, it's God within nature. It's God concealed. God sinks within nature, hides within nature, and there's God in the modality of miracles. So Elohim is God concealed. And that is why the opening verse of a Torah uses Bereshit bara Elohim. In the beginning, God created. When you look at heaven and earth, you don't see God immediately. But it doesn't mean that you can't meditate and ponder and peel back the layers. That is the divine, that is the godliness underneath the surface and exploring the sunken source within creation. And so the point is Elohim and Hateva are connected and we can see that by the virtue of their numerology. Now that you got a little bit of a taste for the numerology and that connection, Let's take a look at numerology. So there are many different forms of Hebrew numerology, of Kabbalah numerology, and many systems. The most common, the most popular of all the systems is what we call the normative system. It's called Mispar Hechrachi. Next week, I'm going to talk about all the other versions that are not as popular. But uh, to this week, I am going to focus primarily on or only on this particular one. And I want to make sure that I teach you the system properly. So it's called absolute value, or some people call it normative value. And if you look at your, your the, the page, uh, if you're going to look at page three, I, yeah, page three of your handout, you're going to see you have all of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. There's 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph through Tav. And in addition, there's also vowels. So we have the consonants and we have the vowels. The vowels are represented by dots and we'll, we'll start with the letters first. So there's 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Each letter from Aleph through Yud is associated with one through 10. Aleph is one, Bet is two, Bet is also two because Bet and Bet are the same letter. Uh, Gimel is three, Dawud is four, a is five, Vav is six, Zion is seven, Chet is eight, Tet is nine, and Yud is 10. So you can see that you can build the first level of mathematics, Aleph to Yud is one to 10. So now when you go to Chaf or Kaf, it could be 11, no. But here we actually have a, a different system where then now it goes to the second number. Chaf becomes 20, Lamed becomes 30, Mem becomes 40. I mean, final Mem is the same as Mem. 
Nun and final Nun is 50, Samach is 60, Ayin is 70, Pei and Fei are 80, Tzadi and final Tzadi are 90, Kuf is 100. That is the second layer. And then there is Resh is 200, Shin is 300, Tav is 400. So if you wanted to say, let's say 432, you would say Tav, Lamed, Bet. Tav, Lamed, Bet is 432. There's even a way to, to do higher. So we have a basic system from zero to 400, or from one to 400. Um, we can even go higher than that um, by using, let's say, you know, you can go, let's say you want to do 751. 751. So you just go um, Tav, Shin, that's 700 right there. 50 is Nun, that's Nun. So Tav, Shin, Nun. And we have Aleph. So Tav, Shin, Nun, Aleph is 751. So that's, that's you can basically go to 1,000 if you wanted to. There's even a way to go higher than that. Uh, but I'm not going to, it's not necessary right now for, for the numerology. So I, I, if you take a look at this, uh, this sheet, this chart right here, you can, um, you can get a very good idea just right here from the chart uh, as how the system works. This is the normative system. It is the most common system of gematria of numerology. So let's just go over one more, uh, 161, 165. So 100, Kuf, Samach, hey, Kuf, Samach, hey, is 165. Let's do uh, 315. Shin, or Sin, but Shin is the same. Yud, hey. Okay, do um, 93. Tzadi, Gimel, Tzadi, Gimel. So this is how you would write these numbers. And in these letters would correspond to those particular numbers. Okay, so I think that it's pretty self-explanatory. The tens, then the twenties and thirties and forties and so on, and then the hundreds. Um, so this is the first system, the most common system of numerology. You can really go anywhere with it. You can add up any number. I'm sure some of you are already starting to add up uh, the digits of your name which is probably the most common thing people do when they first learn this system, which is interesting on its own right. And we can talk about that, I hope in class four, we're gonna go into some of the personal numerology. Um, let's go into the Nikudot. The way that the Nikudot, the vowels work at the bottom of the page is that um, it's a very simple method where each dot represents 10 and each line represents six. So. The kamatz is comprised of a dot and a line, so you'll see 16 there. The patach is just a line, it's six. Tzere is two dots, it's 20. Segel is three dots, it's 30. So you get that idea. Um, at, now, there's different times that you use the nukudot, the vowels, and there's certain times that you don't use the nukudot. For example, if you're gonna go biblical, there's no nukudot in the Torah, so you wouldn't be using them. Sometimes, some commentaries will use them. I, I'm gonna try to give you a little bit of all of them. Now. This chart is critical, but once you have the chart, you literally have that chart. Once you have it, you understand gematria and the world is your, you felt the fish, not the non-kosher version. That's it. I mean, you can go nuts, but remember, don't go nuts because it has to be authentic. You can't just start coming up with your own stuff and, and start you know giving us the the, 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 who's going to win the election. But once you know the formula, you got it. So the letters go from one to 400. The numbers, the vowels shift, but don't worry about the vowels. We're not going to go so much into the vowels. They have their own kind of world uh, on their own. Uh, people ask often, when did this get developed? According to our tradition, according to the, the Nachmanides says, and Maimonides uh, also says that this came from Moses at Sinai. He wrote this down and just, and it's not just the text that has meaning, but there was also the, this code, the numerology, which means in other work, in, in other words, the Torah is not a literary work. It's also a mathematical work. It's also an artistic work. It's also a musical work. And it can be understood on multiple levels, which means that there is an embedded 
code. The code is from the beginning, from the beginning of the emergence of the Torah at Sinai, we already have the formula for gematria for matching words. And the numerology is there as the code within it. So the messages are encoded. And, and a good match really helps us decode that particular message. So now that we understand the nature of it, let's practice some gematria. I'm going to actually show you some examples. You know, we did a lot of theory. We did a lot of background so far in our class. We set the foundation. We spoke about Kabbalah. We spoke about why it works. We spoke about that it's the code of creation. And now I gave you the chart so you can now have the, math, the formula for yourself. Let's jump in. Here we go. Okay. Now, you can't understand Torah without Gematria. And you're about to find out why. You cannot understand the Bible if you don't know the code. So yes, the code goes deeper, but it's also basic. And I want to give you some examples. Let's look at Bereshit, Genesis 14, 14. Um, it's not just a random verse. It happens to be in this week's Torah portion. So let me tell you a little bit of the background of this particular story. So what happens is that this is, Abraham, before his name was changed, his name was Avram. And without the extra hey in it, later he gets the letter hey later uh, in his name. So the Torah tells us, the Bible tells us, that Avram's nephew, Lot, got caught up with some kind of regional war, some kind of battle, and he was taken captive. And so obviously when your family is taken into captive, as anyone would do, Avram springs into action and he endeavors to rescue his nephew who had been taken as a captive in war. And the verse talks about it. So I'm just going to read the verse in English. When Avram heard that his kinsman had been taken captive, he mustered his retainers. This is English translation. Uh, born into his household, numbering 318 and went in pursuit as far as done. Now, the verse talks about this 318 men. We know that there were no 318 men. Abraham did not have that. I mean, yes, his nephew Lot was a prisoner of war. He was a POW. But, but how many military men did he actually go with to rescue his nephew. The Torah tells us 318, but we know it's not true. It's our family. We know the story. The story never happened. It never happened. We don't know this because of numerology. We just know that there were no 318 men. So why is the Torah saying 318? Well, let's look at how numerology fits right into the Torah. Actually, Avram only went with one person, and his name is Eliezer. His assistant, his trusted servant. And if you look at the top of my slide here, I spell out Eliezer. And you can do the numerology if you want. So the Aleph is 1. The Lamed is 30. The Yud is 10. The Ayin is 70. The Zion is 7. Plus the Resh 200 equals 318. That's right. So who did... Who is the Torah saying when it says 318 men? It's actually saying Eliezer. It wasn't 318 people. It was actually one person. It was Eliezer. So the story of Avram entering into the fray of battle, there were two people, Avram and Eliezer. And the Torah says 318 because that is an allusion to Eliezer. He went with Eliezer. So again, when you read it in the translation of the Torah, even if you read it in the Hebrew, you could think, my gosh, Avram has this entire army that he went with, but it never happens. He never went with an army. So that's just an example, just an example of how gematria reshapes our understanding of the Torah, and it helps us understand what really happened. Let's look at another, uh, another look. Genesis 42 Two. 
So this is the story about when a famine broke out and uh, Jacob sent his children to go to Egypt to buy food because Egypt had, had uh, saved up food and Joseph was there, even though Jacob has no idea Joseph is there. And he'd been sold as a slave. I'm sure many of you know the story. It's uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber, right? Technicolor Dreamcoat. And uh, he's second command. He's the viceroy to the Pharaoh in Egypt. And what does Jacob say? He says, now I hear that there are rations. This is the verse. There are rations to be had in Egypt. Now go down and procure rations for us there that we may live and not die. The word he uses is a fascinating word. It, the Torah could use many different words to describe this, but it uses the word redu. Resh, dalid, vav. Do the numerology on it? 210, right? The resh is 200, the dalid is four, the vav is six. How many years were the Jewish people in Egypt? You got it, 210 years. So when Jacob says to his kids, go down to Egypt, he's alluding through numerology, go down, the word radu, go down, he's alluding to the 210 years that his children would remain in Egypt. What an incredible, incredible teaching. And we know the story. And the fact is that the Jewish people were in Egypt for 210 years. And Jacob when he first tells his sons to go down to Egypt, not knowing that Joseph was there, not knowing what would happen, tells his sons using this word redu. It's a strange word to use in that context. And redu equals numerologically 210. And that's exactly the number of years they spent in Egypt. Let's just take a look at another one. This is Exodus 35, one and two. Um, Moses convenes the people, he gathers the people, and he talks to them about building the Mishkan. And Moses tells them, so uh, Moses convoked, I'll just read the verses, the whole Israelite community and said to them, these are the things that the Lord has commanded you to do on six days work may be done, but on the seventh day you shall have a Sabbath of complete rest holy for the Lord or to the Lord. God says, build me a home and I will dwell in there, in them, really. I'm not going to get into the details of that particular verse, uh, but build the Mishkan and my presence will dwell amongst you in that space. This was a tabernacle, the, the forerunner to the Bet HaMikdash, the forerunner to the Holy Temple, it stood in Jerusalem later on, but this is the, 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 the traveling Mishkan. And Moses gathers the people, but as he gathers them, the first thing he tells them is that this is going to be a national building project, but only do it for six days a week. And on the seventh day, you rest. God doesn't want you to work even in his own house. Don't work on the Sabbath. A person might think, well, it's God's house. It's really important. Maybe I should work all the way through. But Moses says... No. And happens to be Ela, which has the gematria. Aleph is one, Lamed is 30, Hey is five. It has the gematria of 36. And how many forms of labor were prohibited on Shabbat for the Mishkan? There were 36 forms. There are 36 specific forms of work that were involved in building the tabernacle. And they're also prohibited on Shabbat, on Shabbat, and they're 36. Another, so when he says, Ela, these, he's actually saying these 36 things which you are prohibited from doing on Shabbat. The word Ela is an allusion to that. Again, there's so, so many of them. I just picked a few just to give you a little bit of a taste of it tonight. Uh, here's another one. Leviticus 16.3. The Torah tells us about Aaron entering the Holy of Holies in the Mishkan. And the Torah says, uh, thus only shall enter Aaron uh, the shrine um, 
with a bull of the herd of the sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. And this is referring to the service that actually took place on the day of Yom Kippur, which is the only day in the Jewish calendar that the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, into what we're calling the shrine. And he could only go there during a special time in the service in appropriate way in which he had the offerings. But what does the Torah use? It uses a fascinating word, bezot. Let's do the gematria. Bet is two, Zion is seven, Aleph is one, Tav is 400, and that is 410. And the temple, the first temple in Jerusalem stood for 410 years. So it says bezot. It says this referring to actually the 410 years that the temple stood. Our sages tell us that this is a hint in the Torah to the fact that Aaron would enter the shrine and the descendants of Aaron would enter into the shrine, into the Holy of Holies for 410 years before the first temple was destroyed by the, by the Babylonians. Again, this is an, an illusion, a remez, an illusion to the episode and the reality of Jewish life and Jewish history. The next one is um, that I'm going to do is actually incredibly classical. It's so classical that um, I actually told over this as my Devar Torah, as my special uh, uh, Torah teaching uh, at my seventh birthday. And this is on Tzitzit. So Numbers uh, 1539, I'll just read it to you. That shall be your fringe. Look at it. Let's, we're going to focus on look at it and recall the commandments of the Lord and observe them so that you, you do not follow your heart and the eyes in your lustful urge. Now, if you ever seen tzitzit, it's the strings that we wear on our sides. So we look at them. Uh, I'm looking at them. They're just a very nice uh, woven strings. I don't see how I'm going to look at them and recall the commandments. What does that mean? It says, look at them. I'm looking at them. How do I recall the commandments by looking at them? Well, let's look at the gematria. Sadi is 90, Yud is 10, Sadi is another 90, Yud is another 10, and Tav is 400. Together, that's 600, right? Now, each string has five knots and eight strings, which is 13. So the word Sitsit has the gematria of 600. Our job is to look at them. When we look at them, we see five knots and eight strings, which adds 13, that makes 613. So what does it say? When you look at them, you're gonna recall the commandments. How many commandments are there? You guessed it correct. There are 613 commandments. So literally by looking at your tzitzit with the gematria 600 and the five knots and the eight strings, you have looked at and remembered all 613 commandments and take a look at that. So. This is a great example, I think, of how mainstream the numerology is, even almost explaining the simple meaning of this verse in Bamidbar in Numbers on the word tzitzit. I want to show you uh, another one I think that's really cute. Um, the word harayon, it's the Hebrew word for pregnancy. I did the math for you already, 271. If you take a look at... Um, nine times 30, nine months of pregnancy times 30. It's actually 270, but 271 is the Torah's ideal num number of days for gestation for pregnancy. I thought that was a really cute one for you. Um, again, you can't make this stuff up because Hebrew is the code. And if it's the code, the code always works. It's impossible that whatever is out there is not under the code. So if there's a thing called pregnancy and it takes 271 days, ideally, it's going to be embedded in the Hebrew letters in one way or another. Let's, let's just do a few more of these because I know that you're really enjoying it and they're also a lot of fun. Uh, here's one right over here. The ancient nation that starts off with the Jews again and again. You read it in the Bible from the Jews left Egypt. There's one nation that is like the Achilles heel of the Jewish people, and it's Amalek. It's the nation that time and again provokes the Jewish people. The numerology of Amalek, I did the math for you already. You can see it on the screen, is 240. 
which happens to be, well, not happens to be, designed by code, is the same numerology as the word safek, which is uh, doubt, which tells us a parallel concept. You have a Hebrew word, amalek, 240, and the Hebrew word safek, which means doubt. They share the same numbers, not the same letters, but the same numbers. What is amalek? It's a timeless nation. It's a timeless concept. It's not just the nation that started up with the Jewish people. What is it? It's pouring cold water on your excitement. When the Jews were excited, when they left Egypt, they saw the hand of God, they saw the miracles, they saw the splitting of the sea, they saw the plagues, and a Amalek comes and says, no, who are you kidding? What? You're suddenly so spiritual. All of a sudden you saw God and you saw some plagues and you're so spiritual. And they pour cold water on their enthusiasm and they dampen the enthusiasm. The same thing with individuals, with us. You're, you, people say, oh, you know, people see they're trying to become more spiritual, you're more connected. And you all of a sudden comes along our own Amalek and says, stop getting so spiritual. And what is that? It's our doubt. Our doubt. It's coming and say, take it easy. Don't start doing all these things. It's not for you. The voice, whether it's an internal voice, whether it's an external voice, whether it comes to you from internally or it comes from someone else, that is the timeless Amalek. What did Amalek do after people left Egypt? They were on a high. They could do anything. And then Amalek comes and says, we're going to knock you down. You could have an enemy. You could have a war. But Amalek strove to knock down the Jewish people, to knock them down. And they had the clarity. The timeless Amalek is that safek, is that doubt within us. And that is the same numerology of Amalek and doubt, the same idea. The next one here that I'm going to teach you is a little more complex, but I wanted to show you that there is other elements that are more complex. So this is from Genesis 49.10. It's the final blessing before Jacob passes away. He gathers his 12 sons around him, and he gives them each one blessing. And the blessing to Yehuda, to, to Judah, ends with Yavo Shiloh. The word Yavo Shiloh. If you go do the math, you're going to see that it's 358. And if you do the math on the word Mashiach, Messiah, you're going to see it's also 358, which means that what? Yavo Shiloh, that the Messiah, the Mashiach, the ultimate redeemer, is going to come from Judah through the lineage of King David, who was also from Judah. And this is what we know, that Mashiach actually does, according to our tradition, Mashiach actually comes from the lineage of Judah, and it can be seen here in the numerology. So the verse itself doesn't say that, but the numerology of 358 tells us about that connection between Yavo Shilo and Mashiach. Also an interesting one here, 345, Shilo is the same as Moshe. The Torah tells us that the Shilo, that, that Shilo is um, Moshe, but who's Moshe? Moshe is the first redeemer. And we have a conceptual connection reflected in the gematria of the first redeemer of the Jewish people was Moshe. And the final redeemer will be Mashiach. So go bo, Yavo Shilo, right? Referring to Mashiach. Now we see the connection between Moshe and Mashiach through the word Shilo that Moshe, Yavo Shilo, adds up to Mashiach. But Moshe adds up to Shiloh, and we can see that connection between the first and second redeemer. Again, it's a little more complicated than the other ones. It's not as obvious, but I, I, I'm just trying to explain this in just a few minutes. Um, so, just to give, just just so the first redeemer, just to give you the the summary, the first redeemer, the one that took us out of Egypt, the one that led the way. That was Moses. And there's a connection between Moshe and Mashiach, 345. And this, what about Yavo? Okay, that's very nice. What about the other word, Yavo? That equals 13. 
And what is 13? It's the same gematria as echad. That's right, as one. So how do we make Mashiach come when we introduce Echad, one, into the Moshe, into the Redeemer? When we, we, we introduce the God, well, how, what do we say? And we say, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Hero Israel, Hashem is your God, Hashem is one, Echad. We know that Echad. When we, we, we introduce God into the Moshe, into the Redeemer, then we know that that's going to be Mashiach, that's going to be the redemption. The numerology of one is 13. And, and so echad in Hebrew equals 13. And that's the message. How do we bring Mashiach when we make the world a better place? That's how we do it. What is Mashiach? World peace. No more hunger. No more violence. How much we can care. No more pandemics. How much we really need this in our world today. No more suffering. And how do we introduce all of this? When we introduce the one, the echad, the divine, the godly value, the oneness of God, when we bring God into the world, that's what heals all of the stuff that fragments us, that fragments us, that drives us apart, all of the animosity. And when you bring something bigger than us, the oneness, then suddenly people can get along. And that's the connection between Yavo and echad. And the same thing is true in our own lives, which is what I mean is Yavo, Shiloh, Mashiach, which is 358. It equals Moshe plus Echad, 345 plus 13, which is 358. So Moshe plus Echad. And how, so how do we bring Mashiach? When we have Moshe, which what is Moshe? Moshe is symbolic of the Torah. And the oneness of God and the Torah, when that is how we bring God into the world through the study and the practice of the Torah, and that's what brings Mashiach, and that is our mission in life. That is exactly what we're here to do. We are here to create this connection in this world by bringing godliness into this world and making this place a dira betach tonim, making this place a home for God, and that's exactly what we're doing through this course and through our study and everything we are doing. And that, my friends, is what I have to share with you for lesson one. Thank you very much. It's really been uh, uh, a pleasure to uh, share this with you. I hope that it's uh, enriched your lives a little bit. And I hope that it gives you uh, some food for thought over the course of the next week. And next week, we're going to get into the other ways of looking at gematria. This is, again, this is the most common form of gematria. Next week, we're going to explore um, the other less common forms of gematria. So thank you again. It's been a pleasure. And see you next week.